Welcome to the Daily Debrief here on the Law and Crime Network. If you'd like to continue watching our live coverage of the McStay family murder case in California, you can head to our website, lawandcrime.com. First, though, on with the debrief with that particular case where defendant Charles Merritt faces a possible death sentence if he's convicted in the killings of a man, his wife, and their two sons. The family disappeared February 4th, 2010, and for a time, authorities thought they may have simply moved to Mexico. The bodies, however, turned up buried in the Mojave Desert in November 2013. One year after that, authorities arrested this defendant, Merritt, a former business partner to victim Joseph McStay. Merritt's DNA is on the steering wheel and gear shift of the McStay family vehicle found abandoned near the border. But the defense says that's because Merritt and McStay shook hands at a restaurant before the disappearance. The prosecution started the case with these opening statements. How does this family of four disappear off the face of the earth? How does this family of four, a husband who's running a business, a mom who's raising her two kids, fixing up a house they just bought recently, how do they just disappear? Just up and gone. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence in this case will show you not only the how, but the why, and especially the who. The how is that each member of this family that you see here, Joseph McStay, 40 years old, his wife Summer, their two kids, <clears throat> Gianni, who was four years old, and Joe Jr., who four days before they were murdered, had just turned three. The how is that they were beaten about the head and face until they died. And then they were taken 100 miles away from their home and buried in the desert. They were buried in such a manner that animals tore at their remains. That they decomposed to almost nothing but a set of a few bones. The why boils down to a basic human emotion, something that we discussed during, during jury selection. The why boils down to greed. The why boils down to greed and greed's child fraud. And the who is sitting here in court today, Charles Merritt. The who is the person who, while claiming to be Joseph's best friend, was nowhere to be found when it came to calling the police when they were missing. Didn't call it in. The who was, while claiming to be Joseph's best friend, the man who, while claiming to be Joseph's best friend, was forging checks from Joseph's business and taking money from him, putting his hands in the cookie jar. The who, the evidence will show, is the person whose cell phone activity for significant portions of time during significant days and times around the time of the murder is off the grid. The defense, meanwhile, focused on the business relationship between the defendant and the one victim and said the defendant did all he could to help find the family, the McStay family, that is, while that family was missing. When we see the McStay family, we see, you know, victims. We do. And we want justice for them as well. What you got to realize is Charles Merritt, which everybody calls Chase, that was his best friend. Joseph was his, Joseph was, his brother will say, yeah. Chase was just his best friend. <clears throat> the loss is also to him. And we're focusing on that. It's funny during the uh, people the opening, they say, he wasn't there when the police were called. And then they kind of passed over the fact he's the one <clears throat> that contacted Joseph's mother, Susan. Says, Susan, it's now Tuesday. 
I had a talk to Joseph. We talk every day. Sometimes we don't talk over the weekend, but we haven't talked in a couple days. There's a problem. We need to call the police. No, I'm sure they're just gone. Well, I'm going to go to his house and check on him. Okay. So he does. The only urgency to find Joseph was Chase. Joining me tonight here on The Daily Debrief are attorneys Brian Buckmeyer and Heather Hansen. Good to see you both here as we break down this important case. Good to be here. <laughs> Quite a case. All right, so I see a couple different aspects to this case. One is the financial business relationships aspect. That's one aspect. And the other is the DNA aspect. So there's a couple of competing types of evidence for the jury's attention. Brian. Yeah. Uh, so from the defense aspect, as a defense attorney, that you address the business aspect. You address the relationship that this uh, that your client had with him and show that it's benign, that he continued to try to look for his friend, that he can try to run the business. When it comes to the DNA, DNA has a lot of complex aspects to it. Uh, I think the defense attorney brought up was trying to transfer DNA and show why it was there for a benign reason, not for a malicious one. Yeah, Heather, uh, one part of this that really enamored me last night, listening to some of the defense's lengthy openings, is this unknown DNA that apparently the defense had to test that was found with the bodies, and they're saying, well, results are going to be back in two days. How often do we see a case start where the DNA evidence is not in the bag long before opening statements? Yeah, and it makes it really hard, Aaron, for both sides to know what to prepare for, how to prepare cross-examination, and how to deal with this very complex evidence. So it is something to watch for and to watch how attorneys on both sides play with it. Brian, one question that the defense brought up is, why are the graves spaced out the way they are? The defense claims it indicates there's more than one killer. Is that enough to deflect attention, or could jurors just sit there and say, okay, maybe he worked in concert with someone? In of itself, no, but I think as most defense attorneys try to do, you try to get a little bit of evidence here, a little fact here that builds to reasonable doubt. And Heather, you're agreeing. Yes. You're seeing every little chip they can possibly take. They're going to take it in Abs a case that's going to last months. Absolutely. And they have chipped away even in their opening. They've given a good reason for a jury to say, you know what, I'm starting to doubt a little bit here. This is going to be an interesting case. It's going to take these months and months and months. Are jurors going to start to, I hate to say it, but fall asleep mm -hmm. trying to process all this? How do you keep a case alive that's going to last that long? Personality. I think uh, within the spectrum of how you can present information, people watch TV and expect a trial to work a certain way. Now, it absolutely doesn't, but however flair you can bring it in, you try to keep them engaged as best as possible. Good points, good discussion. We'll be back to you both in just a second. A trial we were hoping to cover this week on the Law and Crime Network ended with a surprise guilty plea. Jason Dalton admitted to being the trigger man who gunned down six people in the Kalamazoo, Michigan area. Dalton told law enforcement officers that he had just begun driving for Uber and that the devil spoke through his phone and starting con started controlling his body. However, an appeals court threw many of those statements out of court because police did not honor Dalton's requests to remain silent and have an attorney present for questioning. First, let's listen to the pleas on those top charges. These are words the victim's families have waited three long years to hear. You did murder Mary Lou Nye, contrary to Michigan law, uh, which would be, in essence, subject to murder, which is a uh, felony that's punishable by life in prison. As to that charge, how do you plead? Guilty. You did, in fact, murder one Mary Jo Nye, contrary to Michigan law. As to that charge, how do you plead? Guilty. Did you, in fact, uh, commit a murder of one Barbara Hawthorne, contrary to Michigan law, a felony punishable by up to life in prison? As to that charge, how do you plead? Guilty. Did you, in fact, commit the offense of open murder with regard to Dorothy Brown, uh, a felony punishable by life in prison? Uh, as to that charge, how do you plead? Guilty to that one, too. Did you, in fact, commit uh, the offense of murder upon Richard Smith, Contrary to Michigan law, that would be a felony punishable by life in prison. As to that charge, how do you plead? Guilty. Did you, in fact, murder Tyler Smith, uh, the felony punishable by life in prison, with obviously the associated DNA testing that would be associated? As to that count, how do you plead? Guilty. Did you make an assault upon a K, a minor child, with the intent to commit the crime of murder, contrary to Michigan law? 
That is a felony that's punishable by up to life in prison or a number of years. Uh, is consecutive to any sentence that might be imposed uh, for if basically uh, life or any number of years, uh, along with DNA uh, testing that would be involved with that. As to that charge, how do you plead? Guilty. Those were some of the pleas. The other pleas involved weapon charges. As part of those pleas, Dalton gave up his right to a mandatory appeal and said this was the fate that he ultimately wanted. Dalton, court has been advised of your intent to enter guilty pleas as to the various counts of this information. You should be advised that if you do enter such a plea, you will be waiving or giving up certain legal rights. You understand that? Yes. Has anyone threatened you to get you to enter a plea today? No. Um, besides what's been put forth on the record, has anyone promised you anything to get you to enter a plea? No. Okay. You're doing this voluntarily of your own free will? Yes, I've wanted this for quite a while. Okay. You understand that if you uh, change your mind or say that you didn't want to enter a plea, uh, the testimony you're giving right now can be used to support the fact that the plea is voluntary at this time. You understand that? Yes. Are counsel aware of any threats or inducements to the defendant to have him tender a plea at this time? No, sir. No, Your Honor. I'm aware of none, Judge. As part of this hearing, Dalton's defense attorney provided some insight on what got us to this point. Apparently we don't have that. Sorry about that, folks. Let's jump into our panel discussion now. Attorneys Brian Buckmeyer, Heather Hansen, with me once again today. So what we were going to hear in that clip that unfortunately we didn't hear is some breakdown between the attorney and the client. They had all these discussions and the attorney said, the client is not abiding by my wishes. Now, Brian, you're in the criminal realm all the time. Walk us through that process. So the prosecutor is presenting you with an offer. You, by law, are mandated to explain that to your client, both the collateral consequences as through jail time, parole, immigration, housing, all of that. Once you explain it to your client and they want to take an offer that at least you personally believe might not be in their best interest, your job is pretty much it. Like, you can fight and push back and hope and pray, but like we were speaking about earlier, at the end of the day, that decision is theirs. End of the day, it's the client's decision, exactly. So, Heather, I really wanted to watch this trial go down because <laughs> so many of Dalton's statements were thrown out of court because the police messed up big time in yeah. this case. I was curious to see how prosecutors were going to push this case forward without all those statements. I don't know about you. Well, I was, of course. I mean, I think many of us were eager to watch this case and eager to see how the defense was going to use an insanity defense in a case like this one. But for the victims mm -hmm. to see this case end this way, where he stands before them and admits to pleading guilty to each one of these crimes, knowing he can't appeal it, that is worth us giving up the high interest of watching this type he of He can trial. appeal it, but it has to be a permissive appeal right. where the appeals court has to look and somehow find fault with the process. It's, in other words, Rare. it's an extremely slim shot. But right. uh, Brian, let me go back to you one last time. He's eligible for life. I'm going to be shocked if he gets anything less when he's sentenced. Yeah, I, I cannot imagine that at all. With a case like this, this many victims, and we watched all the pictures flash by one more time. Correct. Um, when, when you take a plea like this, you basically put yourself at the hand of the judge. And the judge has a sentencing guidelines, and they can go with anywhere in that spectrum. But something as, as grave as this, you're definitely looking at the top end. We, of course, will be watching for the sentencing. Another case we're following here on the Law and Crime Network uh, should start streaming soon, despite a couple of delays. Melanie Ian faces charges in Florida that she stabbed her boyfriend to death and then fled to Maryland. A first trial resulted in a hung jury. All of the jurors in the first case wanted to convict her, but they disagreed as to the crime. Ian's defense attorney say someone else in the house stabbed the victim and then cleaned up. They say Ian fled because she was scared of the true killer. We're waiting for opening statements in that one tomorrow morning. Actor Kevin Spacey appeared in a Nantucket, Massachusetts courtroom yesterday to answer charges that he groped a teenager. Spacey faces one charge of indecent assault and battery on a person over 14. His attorneys entered a not guilty plea on his behalf. The judge agreed to a request by the defense to preserve cell phone data from the accuser, who was the son of a former Boston television news anchor. In court documents, the defense attacked the accuser as unreliable and accused him of creating an entirely false persona during this 2016 encounter. 
Those charges from the defense include accusations that the victim lied about his age with the victim admitted to in police reports. The accuser says Spacey bought him between eight and ten drinks, unzipped his pants, and touched him for several minutes. The teen says he recorded some of that altercation. Still ahead tonight on the Daily Debrief, graphic images in the case of a man accused of murdering his wife in front of their children. Plus, a woman takes a wild ride behind the wheel of a squad car and, as usual, it's caught on tape. We'll tell you how it ended in Top Crimes. That is after the break. Welcome back to the Daily Debrief, folks. Testimony resumed today in the trial of a man accused of stabbing his estranged wife more than 40 times as their son watched. This case is coming to us out of southern New Jersey, where defendant Jeremiah Monell faces a series of charges, including first-degree murder over the death of his wife, Tara O'Shea Watson, in December 2016. The maximum penalty for Monell is life without parole. Authorities have long said the couple's child, also named Jeremiah, witnessed the attack. In court last week, police officers showed jurors the blood-stained blanket under which the victim's body was discovered. The first day of testimony started late because the defendant was 90 minutes late to court. He claimed it was because his jailers were mistreating him. The judge said that if Monell was not on time in the future, the case would just move on without him. Testimony today centered around the bloody knives found behind the family's kitchen stove. At least one of those knives is said to contain the defendant's palm print. Why did you search behind the stove? Just as part of our search of the residence, we check all areas. And when we pulled the stove out, we observed items of, of evidence behind the stove. And what did you observe behind the stove? Two knives with suspected blood. There were, two there were two knives behind the stove. One was larger and one was smaller. This is a view of the stove pulled out, looking down at the ground behind, behind the stove, and there's two silver knives with suspected blood behind the stove. This is a close-up of those same two knives with suspected blood. This is a view of the larger knife with the suspected blood stain, and you can see the damage to the knife as the uh, blade portion of it is bent and, uh, in sort of the uh, U-shape. That's a view of the opposite side of the knife, the larger knife. This is the smaller knife with the suspected blood, and it had damage to the front tip portion of it, which was bent. And that's the opposite side of the smaller knife. On cross-examination, the defense asked another police officer a series of questions about the palm print on those knives. The defense point was somewhat hidden, but seemed to be that it would be no surprise that the defendant's print would be on one of his own knives in his own house. The question seemed to be whether the print was under the blood or part of the blood. No, sir. The only other friction ridge skin detail that I recall was uh, not enough for identification purposes, but there would appear to be suspected blood, patent print on the white surface of the refrigerator within close proximity to the knife block. Did you notice the uh, friction ridge skin impression on the knife handle, is that right? Uh, a patent prints are on the handle of the knife, yes. Um, you don't know if the blood was already on the knife handle when the ridge impression was made, right? Can you reword that, sir? You're, you're asking me if... You don't know if the blood was already was on the knife at the time the impression was made. Yeah, that, that's not correct, sir. A patent print, you have the material on your friction ridge skin, you then come into contact with a non-blood, grease, oil-bearing surface and transpose or reproduce the friction ridge skin detail onto that substrate or surface. So it's not possible that there was any blood at all on the handle of the knife at the time the, the friction ridge uh, skin impression was made on that handle? Well, I couldn't say, sir, if blood was or was not on the handle. I'm just explaining how that patent print arrived to be on the knife handle. Right, but there could have been blood on the handle at the time this friction ridge impression made on the handle, right? Not to cause the impression, but in another location or of the handle, of course. Tony in the Monell case continues tomorrow. And now to Anthony Velez with a look at other incidents making headlines tonight. Here are today's top crime stories trending on LawandCrime.com and across the country. 
A mother in Colorado under arrest after her child was found dead in a storage unit reportedly encased the boy's body in concrete. 35-year-old Alicia Pankey turned herself into authorities after her son, 7-year-old Kaden McWilliams, was found dead inside of a locked storage unit in Denver. Authorities believe Kaden was killed at the storage facility in May and found his body after reportedly receiving a tip. Pankey is being held on $250,000 bond and is scheduled to appear in court on January 9th. Investigators in Colorado are reportedly working to identify human remains found about 100 miles from the area missing pilot, Kelsey Barrett, was last seen. The 29-year-old mother disappeared on Thanksgiving and was last seen with fiancé, Patrick Frazee. The remains were discovered at an abandoned truck stop near the town of Aguilar. Investigators reportedly don't believe the remains belong to Barrett, but she is presumed to be dead. Frazee was arrested and charged with multiple felonies in connection with Barrett's disappearance, including first-degree murder. Authorities in Ohio released dash cam footage of a woman stealing a police cruiser and leading officers on a wild chase. The unidentified suspect reportedly claimed she was raped as she is seen engaging with officers in Mount Gilead, who were responding to a call of a crash and driver fleeing the vehicle. That's when she jumped into the police cruiser and took off. The suspect eventually lost control of the vehicle and crashed before attempting to flee. She now faces charges of receiving stolen property, failure to control, and obedience to traffic control devices. Those were today's top crime stories. I'm Anthony Velez for The Daily Debrief. All right, Brian Buckmeyer, Heather Hansen, if you were to pick which side you want to be on in that case, defense or prosecution? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> prosecution, you can keep on defending. Sure, sure. I like a challenge. Okay, how does one defend someone in a situation like that? Um, again, chip by chip. Uh, I, I think what I, I wasn't fully getting the whole palm print, imprint thing. I was kind of agreeing with the specialists there, uh, where they were talking about how the blood gets onto the handle. But uh, I think you raise enough reasonable doubt to, to push a needle. So this is in the Monell case? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> I got you. So we're back to that one. But uh, yeah, I mean, certainly this is going to be a tough one for the defense to, uh, to try to overcome because there's just so much evidence. We're just about out of time on the debrief. Brian Buckmeyer, Heather Hansen, appreciate you joining us as guests tonight. Great to be here. <laughs> All right, that's all the time we have. As I said, if you're watching us on the Law and Crime Network, we are going to continue our live coverage of the McStay family murder case from California. If you're watching us on Cox Media Stations, we will see you tomorrow here on The Daily Debrief. Our live coverage of all trials nationwide is going to begin a bit early at 8.30 tomorrow morning on Law and Crime. Have a good night.